Testing my mic. Welcome to the Burnout Expert Podcast. Today is going to be our first episode. I am very excited to start this podcast. It has been a dream of mine to really be able to show you the tools that I use in my coaching practice in order to beat burnout. As many of you may be able to tackle some of your own burnout without, depending on how deep your burnout is, some of the tools and strategies that I'll be showing you today, you'll be able to take back control and figure some of it out on your own. Welcome to the 911 Shift Ready Podcast. This is season two, episode one, Stop Guessing and Beat Burnout Now. This season is going to be a little bit different. In this season, I am going to teach you about one of the most invaluable tools that I use in my coaching practice in order 
for me to know what direction I need to go with each individual client, as well as my clients, the responders that I'm working with, for them to know how to adapt and change things on their own so they are not dependent on me long term. So my hope with this is that you will be able to gather some of those tools you'll be able to be able to see how invaluable what this entire season is going to teach you to hopefully help prevent burnout in you and for those of you that are in burnout to be able to um, start figuring out where to go or if you do choose to coach with me you'll already have a really good solid base and we'll be able to fly through things because of all that you are going to learn in this um, season. So let's get started today. Welcome to the Burnout Expert Podcast. This podcast has been a dream of mine. I have wanted to, I do have a, another podcast for first responders and I wanted to bring this podcast for everybody because the tools that I am going to teach you in this season of this podcast, season one, is what I use with the first responders that I work with, the corporate clients, working with entrepreneurs, working with, oh man, all sorts of people who are in burnout. Burnout is so big. I started with first responders in 2018, working with them for burnout, burnout prevention. And through COVID uh, lockdown, the hours that many of them were working when stations were out and they would have to take over for other stations, the hours that they were working were just unbelievable. Uh, we still have some of them that I work with are doing five 24 hour shifts in a row at busy stations where they're not able to get um, enough sleep. So what I've been able to do with them has been astronomical, but they aren't the only ones burning out. There are many others that with what has gone on in their lives in the last three years before that they were already burning out. So with all the pressures of the last three years, we're seeing more and more and more people burn out. So my hope with this podcast is that I can give you some tools. This entire season is going to be dedicated to one of the tools that I do use daily in my practice in working with burnout prevention in my coaching. It allows me to figure out what where I need to start with each individual, because it's different. What's stressing each of you out is different. What's happening at work, what's happening at home, what's happening with your health. All of these things are different for each of you. So I am going to teach you in this entire season about my secret weapon that I use that hopefully you all can use as well now to start figuring out where you should be taking the action steps. So let's get started today. I am also actually with this podcast is changing up the format this season from how I usually do podcasts. Usually it's me coming in here and speaking and I do best coaching. That's where I live. That's where I love. That's what I do. And so my hope is to come into each of these episodes teaching a little bit. I will teach for a little bit, show you some, coach you a little bit, and then I will open it up to anybody who comes into this Zoom call and into the recording. Anybody that shows up live can ask any questions on anything that I have covered, anything to do with burnout, whatever I'm able to help you with. That being said, I will have to stay at a certain level with it because I don't have, you know, your whole health history and um, an understanding really of all of your stressors, but I will do my best to help answer every question um, of those who do come on to the live recordings. If you would like to be 
a part of the live recordings, you can go to the link in the show notes of this podcast episode. And there is a link, put your email address or get on my email list and I'll start emailing out every week before I do a podcast. I cannot guarantee I'm doing them every single week. I have switched to homeschooling one of my children. It was not anything I ever intended to do. Um, And he does have some appointments and things that I have to take precedence. So some weeks I may not get a podcast episode out, but you will be a part of the emails in order to know when I am recording. And hopefully you can hop on live, learn a little bit and ask all of the questions that you have. So let's get started. We're going to start out with diving into burnout. We really need to understand what is burnout. There's so many different variations and ways with burnout. What I am doing right now, for those of you that are listening to this podcast, is I do have a slide deck that is created here as well and some PDFs that I'm using. All of these will be added into the show notes and on my YouTube channel, the recording of this screen of me speaking while using these slide decks is here as well for you. So there's something that I call a burnout ROI. It's your burnout ripple of impact. And there is a ripple effect with burnout that when you get to one stage, you there's certain symptoms that you're feeling. And as you continue going through, you get to the next level and the next level. So we have seven steps, seven stages that I have seen since working with first responders and working with corporate entrepreneurs, working with all sorts of people. And there's a very, there's certain stages that people go through. Now, stage one, two, and three are the top stages where you have a lot of energy. It's not necessarily tons of energy, but it's it's where you're above a green line. So we have a green line. You can imagine this. This is what's on my screen right now. And we have a green line. We have one, two, and three. So three, which is a first one above that green line, is energized. Then next one, we have calm in number two, stage two, and stage one is crushing it. We'll get into those in a second. What we're first going to dive into is what's under that green line. Under the green line is when you're starting to feel those effects of burnout. So stage four is where we're going to start, which is the first, the green lines where we want to be, the green line or above. So underneath that first part of that green line is the stage that I call the overwhelmed stage. That's where you feel like everything is piling up and and you just can't get ahead. Every time you take one step, it seems like more is added onto your plate. You feel like you're on this hamster wheel. Everything also seems to take longer and your focus takes so much energy that to get things done, things, simple things. Um, It depends on which stage you're in as well. But I know for me, when I was in my burnout, making a sandwich mentally took so much energy from me to even open the fridge and try to focus enough to even figure out what was in the fridge to make a sandwich. Physically, things take so much more energy. I used to feel like I was walking through a fog of cement and thinking through a fog of cement. So to move my arm, I felt like I literally, it wasn't air I was moving through. It was this cement fog, moving my legs. And you really can't feel in the stage like you can relax. So if you sit and try, your brain just keeps going. And it's really hard to to shut it off. That's that overwhelm stage. You're just feeling like you're so deep in things that you just can't get out. You can't get that break. You can't get that time to relax. And the next stage that we have, stage five. So that was stage four, overwhelmed. Stage five, which is two stages under that green line, is emotionally reactive. 
this is where anxiety, hypervigilance rules you. Hypervigilance is huge in the first responder world. It's where they're always on surveilling their, their, their surroundings completely, always watching everything around them and not being able to shut it down at all. So with those that are in corporate, those that are um, entrepreneurs, what happens there is you're constantly thinking about all the stuff that you have to do. You're, you're like thinking about what fires need to be put out projects you need to do. Like nothing shuts off. You're just very vigilant about everything that needs to get done. And you're quick to anger. It's interesting. People can go through different stages. You'll see there's actually an anger stage. I'll get into this with another podcast, but um, the quick and dirty is there is an anger stage. And then the stage that's deeper in deep burnout is where that's even shut down, where it's almost no reactive, non-emotionally reactive to stuff where you just checked out. So the anger, as I'm working with those that are checked out, the anger is sometimes good because it knows you're moving up these stages. So all of these stages that I'm going through, we need to move out of them, you need to start moving up that ladder towards the green line to get yourself over the green line. And there's reasons. So this anger has a lot to do with your nervous system um, to do with, uh, try not to geek out too much on science here. I'll just shout out the polyvagal theory. I'll dive into this all in another, in another podcast episode on that. But when you're in this emotionally reactive stage, this is stage five, two stages under that green line, everything is a fire, you are going from zero to 100 in seconds for small things. This is things where with my kids, they'd ask a question and I'd be mad. They'd be like a noise or they're interrupting me from something that I need to get done. There's just, oh, so much like the frustration, um, short fuse with your colleagues, your coworkers, first responders, shorter on calls sometimes. Usually though, this anger, this short fuse going from zero to a hundred hits first at home for all of us. It's where we can take things out on our spouse or our spouse. We just feel like they're always in the wrong and uh, just so frustrated by things that our, our family is doing. Something's not picked up and it just becomes this really huge thing, a big thing to you. And it can get to the point where your family feels like they're walking on eggshells around you. I know that was me. My husband would come into a room and assess what my mood was going to be like because he could smile and I could get mad because of the way that he smiled. Um, it's just crazy where some of this emotional reactive, that's why we call this the emotional reactive stage, where that comes from. It was almost like I was Medusa where all of a sudden I'm this calm, happy, nice, kind person. And then I'm just mad at him. I'm like, why are you looking at me that way? Um, or mad at him for the way that he loaded the dishwasher. You start needing to control more things around you. So the way he does the dishes, the dishwasher, the way the laundry is being done. It's like, instead of being very excited that they're doing these things, you're, we're very, um, emotionally reactive to a lot of these things. And so with that as well, we start getting relationship struggles. We're getting mood swings. You may be losing your cool at work too. We get repetitive injuries, colds and flus start coming up. So your, your inflammatory system, your body's ability to heal is slowing down. So you start noticing that injuries don't heal as quickly or they start creeping up from your workouts. You're not healing as easily from your workouts. You're more sore after your workouts. So all of these things start kicking in when you are in that, that stage five, that emotionally reactive stage. And then in stage six, we get into constitutionally drained. And with constitutionally drained, that is stage six. So as we were just saying, you have that green line and we want to be above that green line. But as you still keep going lower, you've got stage four, that overwhelmed stage, stage five, the emotionally reactive stage, then you get constitutionally drained. 
this is where you're absolutely exhausted. You're pushing from the time that you open your eyes until you go to bed. Coffee doesn't really give you that energy anymore. You may need a coffee and start feeling like you need a pot of coffee, then an IV drip of coffee just to get going, just to be human. Um, I have clients I've worked with where they have said that their family knows not to speak with them until they have had that coffee in the morning. Thing is, is the coffee doesn't give them energy like it's supposed to, and it starts decreasing that effect. Um, so with that as well, we're um, pushing coffee doesn't give you energy and your to-do list just keeps getting longer and longer. You can't focus. You can't work out. You're plagued with injuries that won't heal at all. Constant colds and flus, allergies start kicking in, gut issues, and you start wondering if you really have what it takes to last your career, can you keep up in the position that you have? Can you keep doing this? How long can you keep pushing at home and on the job and in your career? And you start wondering if all these things that you kind of dreamed of to be doing in your career, if they're even possible because of how exhausted you are. Uh, we just had some people just pop in here. I do want them to know that I'm not, um, I'm recording this so it's my screen only. I Nobody will be seeing the people that are popping in. They won't be seeing your names um, or anything like that. So just so that those who just popped in here um, to listen and ask questions at the end, people will not ever see your screen, just so that you do know that. Um, so let's dive in into the last one. So as we've said, there are seven stages here. We have that green line where with that green line, the further and further down under it you get is the further you get into burnout. We have overwhelmed, we've covered emotionally reactive, we've covered constitutionally drained, and the last one is debilitated. That is where we get all intense health issues. That is where gut issues can be turning into Crohn's or colitis where you can't go to work often because of how flared up your gut is. You are worried about being on the job because of accidents. You have bathrooms marked out all over. Um, if you're a first responder, your entire division, you know where every bathroom is. Um, if you're in an office, you are just constantly in the bathroom and worried you can't make it through meetings. That is where you can get into health issues. We can get into autoimmune diseases. We get um, cholesterol, blood pressure, heart, uh, gallbladders being taken out. We get all of these things. Um, within the debilitated, the debilitated, debilitated stage, that's where we start seeing a lot of um, people medical doubt taking stress leave and um, not, not going to work anymore. They are not hanging out with family. They've pretty much pulled away from everybody. It just takes too much brain power, too much energy, too much time. They're frustrated. All of the things from the stages above can still be like, are still there. So that frustration, um, needing to control things, all of that is there. And it just takes so much energy you may be to the point where you're pretty much either in bed or on the couch and that's it. Um, and depression, exhaustion is pretty much ruling your life. So these are the stages under that green line in the burnout ROI, in the burnout ripple of impact. And these are the stages. So for those of you that are listening to this, like what stage are you in? Where are you at? on that burnout stage. We're going to go right now to what is actually on top of that green line. So that green line, we're going to go to stage three. So remember stage four was overwhelmed under the green line. We're going above that green line, energized. Energized is now where you're calmer. You're able to handle that. You're not going from zero to a hundred anymore. Um, you're not really needing to calm things. Things kind of rub off your back a little bit easier. 
Um, and you're waking with more energy. You're not needing that pot of coffee anymore. It is fascinating when I'm working with clients and we first start talking about coffee and they're like, nope, not ever giving up coffee, which I would never expect anybody to do. Some still have like one in the morning, but they're realizing they don't need it to be human in the morning. There's a difference between enjoying a cup of coffee because you like the taste, you like the experience. You might be, you know, sitting in the kitchen, reading the paper, like relaxing with that cup of coffee. That is very different than needing a cup of coffee to be human, needing a cup of coffee to have energy or to get through your day or to get through a meeting. That is, there's a big difference to it controlling you and you deciding like how it just, you enjoy it. Your body starts healing after your shift, after your day, after you have pushed in a workout, you start healing. You're not as sore after workouts. When you're introducing a new workout, it should make you sore, but your body should adapt. Your body starts adapting to workouts. You're not crashing midday anymore. You don't need that coffee every single day. Sometimes you will. In this energized stage, you're still at a point where there's days you still will get that midday dip. That's fine. That's, you know, a, a great relative to being under that green line. And you have the energy to really start getting things done. You're getting things done a little bit faster. You're, you're starting to check things off of your to-do list and things aren't feeling overwhelmed anymore like they were with that stage under the green line. And then we're gonna get to, so that's energized. That's just one step above that green line. Two steps above is stage two. We call that calm. This is where your brain is focused. You're not thinking through that fog of cement where, where you remember things, you can process things, you can um, get things done much faster when you're doing your paperwork when you're filling out reports, when you're um, asked questions, you can think of the answers. And that, that focus is just amazing. You're a lot calmer, a lot less reactive. You're able to start building back relationships with your spouse here, your kids, with your friends. Um, you actually want to go out and do things. You want to start socializing again and, and start getting back to things that you used to love to do. Um, your tasks are done much quicker than even they were in the energized stage and more efficiently. And these small things don't bother you anymore. You feel like you have your shit together again, where you're like, okay, you know, this career path I chose and my home life, I can do this. There's always going to be days where life throws you curveballs and you're like, oh, Wow, that was quite a day. That's just life. That's how it happens. Nothing's going to be perfect, but you're able to manage it. It's not like you're sitting here thinking like, wow, can I even manage this? As you were in that overwhelmed stage and the stages below it, below that green line. So the top stage is crushing it. With this stage, it's not one you can stay in every single day. So I need to really make that clear. This is where you are setting new goals physically and mentally and crushing them. It's where your mojo is back, where your libido, right? So when you're under that green line, you do lose your libido. You lose uh, that drive that, that drives you in a lot of things. And that starts coming back in that crushing it stage. You know what your body needs and when in order to recover and perform optimally. What I'm going to be teaching you, starting to teach you today, but what we're going to be covering in this entire episode, um, season of this episode is for you to really understand what your body needs when. When do you push in a workout? How long? Um, and when do you know your body needs to be recovering so you're able to push enough to get your body to change, to get it to excel, to get it to have those strengths. But you're also able to understand when your body needs the rest and the recovery. So you're not overtraining. So you're just under that overtraining where you can push yourself enough, but not overtrain. You can keel and all of that. I'm going to really dive into that a lot into this season. 
And with this crushing it, you also feel like you're in control and you can handle anything that is thrown at you on shift. So these are the seven stages. I'll go through them just quickly with you. It was crushing it at the top, calm just under that and energized. Then you get to that green line where we hit overwhelm. Then you get into being emotionally reactive. Stage six is constitutionally drained and stage seven is debilitated. So those are the stages that you would feel when you are in burnout or um, it, when you are experiencing burnout going through those stages. So I'm very curious for any of you that are listening to the podcast, for you guys here, you can put it in the chat, any of you that are watching this now too, if which stage you're at. I know some of you that are on here now, I have actually worked with and you've worked through some of those stages and gotten higher in them, which is amazing. Um, so yeah, you guys can throw in the chat where you're at. So the next thing that we're going to dive into is burnout versus overdrive. And with burnout, there's differences between burnout and overdrive. I'll just cover those first before we go through a symptoms list. The list that I am going to go through, I also have a that linked in the show notes of this podcast. So you can go through this checklist and see where you're at. Most people have pieces from both. So the difference between burnout and overdrive you have a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is your stress and your energy hormone. It is the hormone that is released every time your body perceives a stress. So perceiving a stress means an email could come in or, um, I mean, for us last night, we just got hit with huge snowstorm here. So last night, I knew I had a shovel last night. I shoveled for two and a half hours this morning. Um, these are stressors that we don't often think of, but those push out cortisol. But then we think of getting into meetings for first responders, getting into calls, uh, rushing to calls, being awake uh, 24 hours a day, waking up at 2.30 in the morning to go to calls, all of the stuff that happens um, in your day, kids, all the stuff that happens at home. There's all of these stressors that are happening. And uh, your body releases cortisol for these stressors. And so overdrive is when your body is really pushing out um, cortisol. And that can get to where you get amped up. That is where your libido is usually on super, super high. For first responders, um, that is the first couple of years of their them on the job sometimes. Their libido is like, totally on a high from all the calls and all the cortisol going out until the cortisol starts shifting the other way because your brain sits there and says, hey, what the heck's going on? We're sending out all this cortisol, but you actually don't need all this cortisol because you're not technically fighting that fight and your cortisol lowers. So with that cortisol lowering, you uh, start going into burnout which is where you don't have the energy, where you're getting more of the brain fog. So that's where you'll kind of see that in the burnout ripple of impact that we went over as well, where we had that stage first of emotionally reactive, and then we went into constitutionally drained. So that's kind of moving from like overdrive into burnout. There's a lot of overlap as well. So when we're going through these symptoms right here, um, when we go through all of these symptoms in this burnout checklist, we, um, you'll see a lot of overlap in the symptoms and you might find that you're high in both. That's very, very common when somebody is deeper in burnout. So overdrive, the list for overdrive. Now, as I said, again, this is for those of you that can see my screen, you see, I just clicked on a link that is in the show notes of this podcast. And this is a uh, checklist that you can actually go through and check. It'll email you your results so you can kind of see how many checks you got from each overdrive and burnout and which symptoms they are. So trouble, so overdrive, trouble falling asleep, being tired and wired. You can fall asleep, but you wake a few hours later. 
feeling tired, sometimes hungover, even after a full night's sleep. So you're feeling that disoriented in the morning when you woke up, don't really, you know, just foggy, fuzzy brain. You wake up hungry during the night. You feel tired during the day and you often hit a slump around six hours after waking. So for those that would be on a normal day schedule, that would be like that 2 p.m., that slump where you need coffee, you need carbs, you need sugar, or you want like just to have a nap where you're struggling to focus. You crave, uh, you need a coffee to start your day and sometimes more to make it through the shift. You crave sweets, salty, sugar, caffeine, especially six to eight hours after waking or before bed. You may be anxious, worry a lot. You may think something bad is going to happen. You feel stressed or overwhelmed for weeks, for months, for years. Um, this could be, you may jump at loud noises, no food willpower. Oh, the jumping at loud noises, that was huge. My husband used to be like, it wasn't even loud noises. You could walk around a corner and if I was close by, I'd be like, whoa. I, and it was crazy, but it's like, it's a nervous system thing. So um, my nervous system was so strong in that stress state because I had worked it up so much that jumping at loud noises was um, a big one for me, for sure. No food willpower. Um, you just, you can't. You try to eat healthy, but you just can't. You need that sugar. You may need the chocolate, um, you, you, carbs. You, you can't, not the carbs are bad. Just if you're inhaling bags of chips and tons of bread and pastas and all that stuff, like tons of them, and you're living off of carbs, that's where there's a bit of a problem. Um, but no food willpower at all. Do you want you to understand that that is a part of burnout? So a lot of people beat themselves up when they're trying and trying and trying to eat healthy and their mind just won't let them. The willpower creeps in. Just, there's nothing wrong with you. This is a big part of overdrive. You may stress eat. You may have IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, low or no sex drive, mood swings, irrit irritable, short fuse, easily frustrated. You need to control things around you. Overweight, especially around your middle. You trouble gaining weight. Um, this weight too, overweight, especially around the middle. We'll see people too that exercise like crazy, that try to eat super clean, super healthy, and cannot lose that weight around the middle. You can't until you're out of burnout. You can't until your stress system stops firing and firing and firing and sending glucose out, sugar, and um, and having to clean it up because you didn't need energy to read an email or do something that you're, you're mentally stressing over. You may have trouble gaining weight. So maybe the opposite end as well. Sometimes feel really blue or depressed. You may feel like you're never accomplishing enough, often pushing yourself to do more. Your memory may not be great. You may have trouble focusing. We get this where, um, you might be talking to your spouse say, yeah, I'm going to go and do this, this, and this. You walk out of the room and you're like, crap, what did we just talk about? I don't remember the two or three things that I just said I was going to get. That's that, that memory. You think that your short-term memory is, is going on you. For females, uh, menstrual cycles, irregular, they may have PCOS. You may told, be told you have high cholesterol, um, bone loss, osteopenia or osteoporosis. You could get sick easily. Cough infections may linger. You may have frequent nagging injuries that take longer to heal. You may have hives, seasonal allergies, asthma, allergic reactions, uh, diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and high blood pressure or diagnosed with a metabolic syndrome or insulin re resistance or diabetes. We would see a lot of glucose issues with first responders, um, diabetes um, with a lot of them. All right, so that was our overdrive list. Again, that list is in the show notes. So definitely if you want, you can click it and gain access to that. Our burnout checklist. So burnout, you're often feeling exhausted, having to push through your day, and you may describe yourself as feeling fried or feeling burnt out. You wake up mid-sleep um, and it's hard or sometimes absolutely impossible to get back to sleep. You wake up tired, even if you've gotten a good night's sleep. I know for me, I could sleep like forever. And I'd still wake up feeling like my body didn't repair. My body didn't heal. It was just, my brain was so foggy, disoriented, exhausted. Um, you'd feel anxious a lot. 
everything feels overwhelming and it's just hard to get motivated to do anything. You get sick way more often than you used to. Cold sores, herpes, yeast infections, urinary tract infections. You may crave sugar, carbs, salty foods. You don't have a big tolerance for exercise and you really get wiped out easily. This was a hard one for me. My background is as a personal trainer. Sports activities are my life. My husband and I met playing beach volleyball. Like we're just always trying to do sports and I couldn't recover. I couldn't do things. I would start working out. My energy would drain. I would crash. My body would heat up. I would get wiped so easily from doing things that I'm like, oh man, this, this wasn't even a warm up for me in the past. And I couldn't. And it really does mess with your mind. Um, depressed, cry easily, feeling emotionally exhausted. No motivation and drive to achieve is, is very low. May, no low sex drive or no sex drive. For females, uh, hormones are all over the place, absolutely irregular cycles. You may be told you have low blood sugar. Sometimes you get dizzy, especially when you stand up too quick. And sometimes your heart races and you have heart palpitations. Your memory is not what it once was. And you may be diagnosed with chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. Sometimes also it feels you're unable to make decisions in a crisis. Um, you might be okay. So we used to find this with first responders where they'd say, I'm okay on a call, but I can't do anything off of my call. I can't make decisions. I can't think of things. I'm, I'm, it's just, it's fascinating. And there is a whole scientific reason for that. I can dive into the science, but I'm not going to geek out too much on that right now with you guys. Um, wounds take a long time to heal. Acne leaves scars and diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. So those are the um, symptoms of burnout and overdrive. So now that you know what burnout and overdrive is, that's where we're gonna dive into what, where a lot of people struggle when they're trying to get out of, of burnout. And one of the things is that so many people will tell you, hey, you should try this. This is good. Hey, this is great for you. Why don't you try this? This will boost your energy. This will do this. This will do that. The thing is, is that you, every, there's different solutions work for different people based on what's going on in your body and with you. And there's all sorts of strategies that you don't know where to start. And if you are trying something, you don't know if it's working or not all the time, because as you're working your way out of those stages of burnout that we spoke of under that green line, it, it, it's a slow process. And you may get from that debilitated stage um, or getting to the overly reactive stage and you're like, oh, I was not very reactive and now I'm reactive. You might think something's not working when it actually is. Um, you're just working through those stages and your nervous system's actually um, starting to kick in again, the right nervous system. So there's a lot to this. Not knowing where to start is another one I hear from a lot of people and really depends on what stage of burnout that you are in. So there are, in order to know where to start to figure out what solution is really best for you, you need to actually be using objective and subjective data. So the objective data is you telling us like, oh man, I had to run to the bathroom this many times today, or yeah, I'm really short and moody, you know, this day or this time of day, or I have no energy when I'm waking up, I'm not feeling recovered, things like that, or, or your body hurts. That's all objective. It's what you're, you're observing and you're feeling in your body as far as aches and pains and all of those things go. Subjective data is actually is like tests that your doctor may do. If you're going to a holistic practitioner, it may be hormone tests or um, different blood tests, your cholesterol, blood pressure. That is your subjective data. And what I'm going to teach you is a way to get daily subjective data. Um, this whole entire season, we're going to dive into it, is how to get subjective data so that you know what is and isn't working for you 
and you can start going in a direction to get yourself out of burnout. And that starts saving you time and money. Like you're not focusing on the things your body that aren't working for your body. So if somebody suggests something to you, you can try it. And from what I'm going to teach you, you'll know if it's working or not in your body. And you'll know if you should continue it. Sometimes too, the progress is so slow that unless you have subjective data that's telling you, oh yeah, this is giving you like 10 minutes more of sleep. You still may feel like crap in the morning, but you know that your sleep is starting to get better from doing that, that you know to continue it or vice versa. It might be decreasing those things. It might be increasing your stress markers. And you're like, oh, this one's not for me. So you don't have to do it. So it saves you time. You know where to focus. You're not spending money on the things that aren't working for you. And you're not so frustrated. And so what we're diving into is in this whole season is I'm going to be diving into how to really read your deep data from a whoop or an aura ring. And you don't have to have one in order to really benefit from this, from this podcast, from the episodes. Um, and if you already have a health tracker of some sort, definitely work with it first. Apple Watch, <coughs> Apple Watch does um, have some of the information that the Whoop and Aura have, but they, with their sleep, they mix everything together. So I can't get as granular with the sleep, but you can definitely get enough information from a, an Apple Watch in order for everything that I'm teaching you to benefit you. And I worked with, I know somebody who had a Garmin, we could get some stats, but it, it Garmin was more for daytime activity and not as much for the nighttime of, of what you are doing. So we're really going to be diving into a whoop, the whoop bands or ring to be able to find out um, a lot of information. So the main things we're going to be going over is sleep. So both Aura and Whoop have sleep scores. They'll break down your latency. So how long it took you to fall asleep. Remember when we went through those overdrive and burnout scores, the one for is tired and wired, can't fall asleep. Also waking mid sleep. And if we can find out how much REM sleep, deep sleep, and light sleep we're getting, then we'll also know what's going on. Deep will tell me some information of, you know, if it's something physical going on with you. Um, we can also find out about sleep deprivation with some of this. We can talk about gut issues. There's so much information we can get from the sleep data that comes out of this. Um, how long your sleep was, it'll tell you versus how long your body needed. So it really does tell you, you needed this much sleep in order for your body to recover from everything you've been pushing. Now, does this mean that you have to be perfect with it? No, it's data. It's great data. So on your days off, on your weekends, when you can really catch up on that sleep, then you can do so. Um, then it has a readiness or a recovery score. So one of them's readiness uh, and the WHOOP gives you recovery. This one is amazing. I love this. This is showing actually one of my days that I was in the red. Um, you don't want to be in the green every single day. I'll be diving into a lot of this in this season's episode. When you do a workout, you want your body to either get into the yellow or the red right after a workout. You want it to, because that's telling you, well, sorry, from a tough workout, a one that you really, really, really pushed and should have kicked your butt. You want to be a little bit lower the next day, but how long does it take you to recover and get back into a green recovery? That's going to help you really figure out if you are um, overtraining, if you really should be pushing again, when you should be pushing again in a tough workout in order to maximize your results and your recovery, all of these different things. So this readiness and recovery is amazing. Also, if um, for burnout, there's a lot of deep stuff we need to go into with burnout for this one. And the other main stat that these, the WHOOP and the Aura give you is your activity or your strain score. These are very different from the WHOOP or the, the um, the aura ring. I originally, I had an aura ring for years and I only started putting a whoop on 
in order to test it for the first responders because a ring for them, a titanium ring is not functional for everything that they do. And the strain score that shows in the loop was so invaluable that I actually thought after a month or two of testing it, I would know enough for my responders when I would give it to my husband, but I haven't. So you'll see, I always wear a whoop and an aura ring um, to get both. So the strain score is phenomenal because it adds up your strain during the day, mental or physical, which is absolutely amazing how it really does. Um, it, it, it helps you understand how much your body is actually stressing and how much it needs to repair. When you're in deep burnout, you may wake up with a strain score. If you have gut issues, you may wake up already with a strain score when you have woken up. Um, you'll figure out too that simple things actually strain your body more than they would if you're not in burnout. Uh, for different things that are happening in work, for first responders, different shifts, we learn, okay, how much do certain shifts push your body and what happened on shifts? So then they know when, if their strain score is really high, they know that they can only push it so much more in a workout and they can watch it as they're working out to know how much more they can push it so their body can still recover and they can still get a workout in, but without overdoing it. So I love, I love the strain score on the whoop for that reason. These both dive into as well, like cycle things. So for females, there's different times of the month. The whoop is better at doing this than aura as well, of letting you know what weeks you can be really pushing harder and which weeks, like, so you might notice that the same activity during a different stage of your cycle is actually going to increase your strain score more than another stage. So it's really fascinating. But with all of these, um, your readiness, your sleep, will when we start looking at these, when I start coaching somebody, diving into all of these stats, I dive way deeper, which we'll get into in this whole season of episodes. This is just the quick and dirty 30,000 foot view, but we will dive in and uh, really be able to figure out like how your metabolism is, metabolism is or where your you know, gut issues, like all kinds of things you'll be amazed at things that we can find out from this. Um, that'll help us know where to, I always know where to start with a client. And when you're working on things, if you're working on things for sleep and you do find, Hey, my deep, deep increased like 10 minutes, even though you still feel like crap, you know that you're on the right path. So you, it's, it gives you that motivation to continue doing what you're doing. That's way we know if somebody is doing something, if it's working, if it's not working and really keeps us, allows us to really fast track where we should go with people. So as I said, this is really only the tip of the iceberg. We're going to be diving into supplements and I'll be, I'll be using all of the, the episodes from this season to dive into all kinds of different things. Um, burnout, overtraining, gut and stress, tired and wired, waking mid sleep but I'll also be teaching you how to use the whoop and the aura ring in order to um, be able to just see where you're at and using all of these for your daily data, for that subjective data in order to help you get out of burnout. All right, I am going to open this up for questions. If anybody who is listening has questions, I'm going to check the chat. If you, because I know just keeping this anonymous for people as well. You can actually write your question in the chat if you don't want to speak. If you're okay to speak, I will bring you in. And as I said earlier, anybody who does speak, um, I your video won't be showing. I'll only have it as my screen showing. <clears throat> Sorry. We do have a mailing list. I'm going to link that in the show notes. So we have a mailing list that if you want to get on where I will let you know when I'm doing the recordings and you can hop on here. All right. <laughs> let me just check the chat. Oh, cravings. Okay. Okay. So somebody is asking what's the best way to combat cravings? Um, what are the cravings? Sugar, salt, <laughs> Carbs. Sorry, I don't know why I'm coughing. All of them. Okay. 
Hey, I know that you have a whoop. So with your whoop band, how are your recovery scores? Are your recovery scores um, in the yellow? Are you in the green? Where are your percentages of recovery scores on a regular? If you're taking your time to look, I'm just chatting just so there's not the noise. They're mixed. Yeah, your sleep cycles are all over the place. Um, so how quickly do you recover after? So do you feel you're giving your body enough calories and nutrients? Because I know for you, you are very, very active physically active and your job is very, very demanding, long hours, crazy hours. So are you getting enough calories in? Do you feel? Okay. So my pleasure. Somebody's just leaving right now. Thank you. Um, okay. You feeling like you're overeating and you're noticing weight gain and an inability to cut weight. All right. I'm wondering about overtraining. Um, trying to think of this. This is interesting because normally you and I are having a conversation back and forth and I can ask a lot of questions. So random cycles. You're gaining weight. How's your sleep? It's okay. I can't um, change the audio for you. So it will be your voice showing just so you know. Um, I'm okay with this. I'm just also thinking. Um, inability to cut weight. So how is your sleep? How's your, what's your percentage of deep and what's your percentage of REM when you're sleeping? Are you getting 20% of deep? Yeah, I usually get um, into the realm of like 20 to 30 percent. Like, it, like even when I have a short sleep, it will tell me that like my ratio is like like optimal or, or where I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like my length of sleep is all over the place. Um, when I'm going to bed, when I'm getting up is all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really, really tough, I think. Absolutely. Um, it's hard to, because when you're sleeping at night is when your body metabolizes and then you get um, leptin and ghrelin releasing, which are your hunger and satiation hormones are supposed to be released at night. That when you are sleeping at night, your hunger cues get messed up big time. So yeah. um, how much REM are you getting? So you're deep, you're saying is high percentage, 20 to 30, but what's your REM? Um, I, I'm trying to think of what the whoop uses, because my whoop's been, my battery's been gone for a little bit, so my whoop's been dead, dead for probably three or four days. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, it's a bummer. Um, but I'm trying to think of what it usually, like, if it says your REM and deep sleep together, I can't remember how it usually. It's separate. So here's why I'm asking you is because deep, your deep is really good, 20 to 30%. Like deep, we really want like 20% and REM 20 to 25. Now what happens is deep is usually the first two thirds of your sleep and right. REM is the last two thirds of your sleep. And when we get into sleep deprivation, deep starts to take over. So I'm right. very curious to hear if you're deep is 20 to 30 percent but your REM is actually decreasing I would wonder if part of that then is sleep deprivation which would mean uh -huh. I know your sleep's all over the place but on your days off if you could grab another nap in there just grab right. a nap as well as your nighttime sleeps on your days off or any other times on your shifts if you can um, if you're home and you're able to, to grab a nap 
in between. So, so I'm looking at my last sleep uh, recorded. It was six, it says six hours, six minutes. I'm assuming that's in bed. And yeah. then the remarks were 29% of your time in bed was spent in REM sleep. Okay. Uh, and it just says, this might indicate your body's making up for not getting enough. But yeah. then when I look at my breakdown, it has uh, deep sleep an hour, 22 minutes. So 18%. And then it has my REM sleep at 29%. It was two hours and nine minutes. Okay. So that's good. Um, I'm just going through. Okay. So it does have that. And your latency is good. And then the supplements, I know that you have been on. Have you, have you done a caramel analysis test recently? You just uh, I haven't. No, not recently. Yeah. This might be something for, I know you're working with um, the practitioner that we've had in the program. Yeah. So she it might be worth revisiting a session with her because okay. this might be I, I know you're great with your supplements you're great with your nutrition it might be interesting to go to her with a food journal mm -hmm. um I mean you can also send me your food journal for sure um send me your food journal and then because I know you're in the program so send it send me your food journal and then I will go through it and see it's like, you do feel that, I mean, you, I know you're great with your nutrition. You do feel it's enough calories for all of your activity. Yeah. So my, my nutrition has kind of been not the greatest to be honest for the last little bit is I find that I just get like uncontrollable cravings that mm -hmm. like I probably end up overeating and just, just snacks or whatever alone. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that, could be the leptin and ghrelin and that's where the practitioner can help you maybe stabilize some of that with certain supplementation mm -hmm. because I know that you and that's the thing is when you can't sleep at night or you're waking up in the middle of the night to go to work then that does mess up your leptin and ghrelin which is your hunger and satiety so that's one thing but the other thing too well you've had quite a year as far as like stress that a lot of hours and everything goes yeah. that have you so the other thought too is have you been doing things to be training your vagus nerve um not i wouldn't say particularly like i started doing um like like I see uh, a therapist that does like hypnosis. Yes, that's not training the vagus nerve per se. So we let's think of this like the gym. Mm -hmm. We need to actually physically get that vagus nerve engaged. So if we think about it, you've your shifts have been crazy this last year. And mm -hmm. every time that you're on shift, as good as you are about stopping and, and um, like, getting yourself you, you've learned how to shift yourself out of that stress state you still keep kicking into it a lot even though you can kick right. yourself out know? so you're it's it's this is kind of like in the gym if we imagine somebody in the gym who only works their upper body and then they wear those big baggy pants to cover that they don't do their legs you basically mm -hmm. are working your stress nerve your sympathetic nervous system all the time and you're not working um, your vagus nerve, you're not working your leg muscles that much. So they're getting overpowered by yeah. the stress nerve. So it is possible. And this, so this is just another thing to be, to be diving into because you haven't been working that vagus nerve is to start doing some vagus nerve, um, trainings. There are some in the program. I will email you after this and I will tell you which lessons from the program are for the vagus nerve. Um, mm -hmm to be doing that uh i can give you so they're just basically like the gym as well every single time that you're working out if you spend three to four minutes getting out of that stress state and and, and training the vagus nerve so that your workouts are ending in your vagus nerve it increases recovery some new research i've been reading on that is so super cool um 
how it actually increases your recovery abilities of your body um, post-workout, mm -hmm. but it also is training your body to keep switching out of that stress state and back into that resting state. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, the reason, the reason that I mentioned the hypnosis is because I know like a lot of the preliminary, um, you know, like exercises and, and protocol um, spend a lot of time with breathing and, and like, you know what I mean? And so that's what like a lot of those sessions end up in uh, like getting into that, like parasympathetic um, nervous system. It, it, Cause in order to, you know, reach a state of like trance or hypnosis, like you have to obviously be really, really calm. So that's the reason I mentioned that, but um, I haven't been doing like the, the uh, gorgeous ball or like things like that. I haven't done that in a long, long time. So how often are you doing the hypnosis? Um, it, I see here every week, once a week. For an hour? Uh, hour and a half. Okay. So think of it like a gym. So if you are doing a lot, uh, if you are doing parasympathetic, you're doing it for an hour and a half, but how many hours in your day are you working the sympathetic nerve? Mm-hmm. Right. So it's just that right. imbalance. So that does sound beneficial. It does sound like it's great. It does sound like it's working it. But what else can you add? Like you do know a lot of your tools from your toolbox, from things we've mm -hmm. worked on. How, what other tools like you can be pulling out, like while you're in the shower, you can be working your vagus nerve in the shower. You can be working it mm -hmm. while you're doing a practice. Right. Right. So the thing is, is think of it like reps. And how many reps are you doing in your sympathetic? So every time you're working out, every time that you're um, at work, you're pushing yourself in your, your sympathetic, your stress nerve. So how right. often are you, how many reps are you doing there versus how many reps do you do on your vagus nerve, your resting nerve? Right. Right. So there's, a, there's definitely an imbalance, especially with, I mean, your last year, you've just worked tons. Um, yeah. Because like my husband's been, yeah, I think it's any time that you and I are chatting, it's like him and you are both like, it's crazy. So, yeah. um, and, and that's it is, is we just have to keep remembering that we have to train both systems and you're really great at training that one system. So let's just start working on using those habits that you use for that to keep training your other system then as well. That makes sense. Yeah. So try that. Um, for salt cravings, I would say um, adding more of your Himalayan salt and mm -hmm. stuff too. That's your body asking for that. But I would wonder how much leptin and ghrelin is playing in a part with you being up at night. Um, right. Your sleep, random and deep, sounds good. Hey, buddy, do you have a scraper in there? I'll Sorry, right give back. me one second. Uh, I don't know if we have one. Okay, we're just gonna wait a sec. I will delete this part in the recording. Sorry about that. No worries, I can come in and edit. I'll just delete that. I just yeah yeah no worries. Myself, I'll delete it. Um yeah, so you're working with or sorry the with your shifts. So training that vagus nerve might start decreasing the amount that your body is in a stress state and it's decreasing your body time that your body is needing like sugar and carbs and every time you're in your stress state you're using magnesium all of those things that your body could be craving a lot of those things could be throwing off your blood sugars as well and so those are things that um going to the practitioner revisiting with her she may be able to check and make sure everything is still on track that all of your um because it's been a while since you've, you've checked your stress vitamins and minerals. So checking those out to see if any of that needs an adjustment would right. be possible, could be the leptin and ghrelin. Um, but the more that you keep switching into that stress state, into that sympathetic nerve, the more that your body is going to be wanting and needing glucose, the more that it is going to be needing sodium, the more that it is going to be needing magnesium, which starts getting like the chocolate cravings and the sugar cravings and the salt cravings and all of those things as well. So it could be a couple of those things. 
Um, I would start off by doing more vagus nerve training. And then mm -hmm. after that, checking and seeing go from, um, uh, what's it called? Um, start working on more of the vagus nerve training so that your, your reps are more equal to the amount of reps you spend in the stress nerve and possibly like revisiting the practitioner and, and seeing where all your levels of your stress nerve are and stuff as well. That makes sense. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. And yeah, I think, um, I mean, it might segue into it, but um, I know that you had like stop snoring, like protocol um, in the main, like in the actual program. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any other like, additional research or or anything like that that you've come across for snoring yeah uh not any other like modalities to try the all the modalities that i have for snoring are in the program um to be working on but that is a vagus nerve thing too that snoring is telling us um a lot too that your that your stress nerves kicking in when you are sleeping so mm -hmm. You need to remember when you started the program too, you're working more on that vagus nerve and, mm -hmm. and then that dry mouth at night, you know, the snoring and stuff starts to, for some, depending on what the issues are for snoring, but for many of you that are living in that stress state, starting to train that vagus nerve more does help with that. Yeah. Um, so that also ties into exactly as you said, it will tie in. So, um, and that ties into more vagus nerve training. And so the, yeah, the, I'll give you the links. I'll email you. I, you know what, let me write this down super fast. So I need the snoring ones and more vagus nerve. I'll email those to you um, from the program I'll, where they are. Um, so that you don't have to go searching yourself and you can start working on some of those then again. Oh, does that answer your questions? Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, I've just been kind of, yeah, I've been thinking about it. So, um, I mean, for the most part, I, I think it does. Yeah. Cravings are brutal. I know for me as well, yeah. what I'm saying if you go to the, the practitioner from the program, if you go to her and get your um, your stress vitamins and minerals tested again, she'll be mm -hmm. able to tell you because like, I remember when I was in Burnett, I could inhale chocolate bars and I realized I was, you know, magnesium deficient, but how much mm -hmm. magnesium do you need, right? Um, and stuff like yeah. that. Too. You just may need to adjust some of the uh, supplements that you're on as well might be that um but at the same time if you aren't evening out those reps of your vagus nerve and your sympathetic nerve then you will continually be going into that sympathetic stress state and continually needing sugars and continually using your your magnesium so the levels that she would test today and your requirements today will be different than three months down the road, if you really work at training your vagus nerve, because your body's not flying through them as much. Right. Same. So that makes sense. Yeah. So it's up to you. Like you may want to start off with doing the vagus nerve stuff and seeing how that goes. And, and the supplements that she had you on may be good again. Well, okay. flying through them again, but if you, you might want to check out with her as well. Okay. Well, awesome. Anything Sounds else? good. No, no, I think that's it. Cause I just, yeah, I noticed that there's a whole trickle down effect of, uh, of like, of stress or, or whatever it may be. And just even like, like relationship stress and just, you know, making decisions within relationships. So I just feel like um, it's all kind of coming from maybe a similar place. Absolutely. And so, that's the thing yeah. too. So this is one reason why I'm sort of mixing this with first responders and others is I like the stressors that first responders do have are definitely huge stressors, 
but a lot of the stuff happens in our home relationships all of that like parental stressors childhood stuff like there's so much that comes from that and the pressures that we actually are putting on ourselves um, in order to what we accomplish and do and our expectations of ourselves that my hope is that mixing this as well with the first responders with you know corporate entrepreneurs with with other people that that um that we start seeing as well how important the home stressors are as well and not right. just stressors. I mean, they're important, the work stressors, right. what they do, but we can control a lot more of the stressors at home <laughs> than we can. Um, uh, you know, sometimes for you, like on a call and all of that. So it's, it's, yeah. it's different. Um, where right. can we control? What can we be doing? It's the same strategies as well at home as it is at work and a lot of it okay well wow. okay all right perfect no that's it for me thank you Amazing. all right we don't have anybody else today but hopefully with this um as people are getting more comfortable and seeing how this goes with more people we will get more people hopping in and asking questions at the end because that's where the fun part is cool absolutely i appreciate it thank you my pleasure all right so that is it for today's episode. If you would like to join us to ask questions at the end, definitely go to the show notes, click the link, um, add in your email to our email list because that is where I'll be letting people know the, the link in future for future episodes. And we are going to be diving way deeper into Whoop, into Aura, as you just saw. I am able to really dive into where somebody's at by starting to look at their stats and where they're at with everything. All right. Take care, everyone. And I will see you in the next episode.